Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. Today's guest is Mike Brennan from MikeBrennan.me. Mike's childhood dream was to be a cartoon, but when he realised that that wasn't possible, he became the next best thing, an artist. He loves sharing experiences and making connections through his art and helping other artists and creatives establish a daily creative habit of their own. We hope you enjoy the show. First of all, thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us today. It's lovely to have you on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And um, we'd like to start by asking you where your creative journey began. Did you come from a creative background? Um, Not particularly. Uh, You know, it's funny because (laughs) my, my creativity really started when I was a kid, probably like most kids, you know, drawing and just doing whatever creative projects you could dream up. A lot of that was centered for me around cartoons and that was my world. I loved watching cartoons, you know, old school cartoons like Looney Tunes, you know, Bugs Bunny, Woody Woodpecker, like all the the good stuff that kids today know nothing about, sadly. Um, (laughs) All that stuff was informing me uh, and my creativity and I just couldn't get enough of that. So I used to actually trace over like, uh, you know, Sunday morning cartoons, you know, or comic strips that were in the newspaper. I used to trace over those and make my own greeting cards for family members. And so that for me was an early on signal that was like, hey, I really like this because I'm drawing, I'm creating something, but then it's actually going another step too. And it's giving it away to somebody and realizing that I can even make somebody smile by creating something and giving it to them. So, you know, it was a really powerful moment for me to to recognize that. Um, And as far as like people around me, I mean, there wasn't anything that was unique or special as far as having access to certain people or even really seeing artists, full-time artists up close. Um, You know, my family, pretty much blue collar workers um, and just, you know, policemen, a long line of policemen that come from that and uh, just you know, people who are, who are kind of just work hard, show up, you know, be in, involved in the system some way. And so there wasn't necessarily a, um, you know, an advantage of, of having creativity all around me in, in that respect. But I think I learned to be drawn to the opportunities that I saw at an early age, you know. So did you take the traditional route and go to art college? And if you did, if if your family weren't creative, how did they feel about that? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, they weren't thrilled, of course. You know, like most parents, when kids say, I want to be an artist, and they're like, no, really, like, what do you want to do? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and it's understandable, right? Because, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, mythology of the starving artist and many people, unfortunately, that's exactly what they think of as soon as they think of artists. And for them to say, well, I don't want my kid to be in that category. So there's obviously trying to to guide towards something more responsible, if you will, uh, something that's better paying and more dependable. You know, those kind of words and phrases were thrown around a lot. But for me, uh, I also have a, a big stubborn streak. And I was so invested in my own art that I pretty much told my parents like, and it was, you know, I don't know who I thought I was kidding, but I was like, well, if I'm not going to art school, I'm not going to school at all. I'll show you. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think they, they eventually came around to it and they were like, okay, listen, if you're going to go to art school, at least pick something like a major that has potential to make more money. Mm. So they, you know, weren't crazy about like, if you just, kind of sit around drawing all day, but they're like, okay, graphic design at least has a commercial aspect to it. And so that's kind of how I ended up going towards that along with the thought of like, okay, well, I really like music. You know, maybe I can do some uh, graphic design centered around music in the music industry or entertainment, you know, those kind of things. And so that's 
where my path for my schooling really uh, came to be, you know, focused was um, in that. Can I just ask, I heard you talk on another podcast saying your dad used to talk about the college that you went to <laughs> saying there are weirdos or something. <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny that you, that you say that because that wasn't in the back of my mind too as I was, as I was saying this. Um, so my dad, you know, he, he was a New York City detective and um, had seen a lot of, you know, the worst of the worst, right? I mean, whenever I wanted to go into New York City, and, you know, we lived right outside of it in Staten Island at the time. So it was a ferry trip over. But he would always be like, you know, I don't want you going and hanging out in this neighborhood because, you know, in his mind, he identified that with, you know, a certain crime or certain thing that happened that he saw there. And he didn't want his children being around that. So, you know, for art school, he was teaching in the academy, which was one block away from the School of Visual Arts. And he would be talking with, you know, some of his, his fellow officers and they'd be outside and they'd see like the artist weirdo people, you know, the people that they probably arrested because of drugs and whatnot. Right. And so, <laughs> the, you know, he'd be saying, you know, oh, look at those weirdos over there. My, none, you know, my kid's never going to go to a school like that. Well, fast forward to <laughs> college years for me. And actually that was one of the schools that I ended up attending was that very school. Uh, so, you know, the irony there is not lost on me at all. <laughs> so you are one of the weirdos. Yeah, I guess so, you know. <laughs> Speaking of weird things, I've heard that you made a really unusual sculpture while you were at college. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> yes, yes. So this was an opportunity that we had in our, it was a three-dimensional uh, illustration class. That's what it was called. And our you know, professor, he, he was one of those guys who made a lot of movie props. Um, and so he took this whole thing of not just like creating sculptures, but having a concept behind it. And so he would give us assignments like, um, you know, design a fish that lived in the East river in New York city. What would that look like? You know, and everybody would have these, these thoughts immediately of like, Oh, that's where, you know, the mobsters dump the bodies or that's where, you know, <laughs> whatever, it's really dirty or polluted, you know? And so all these things with concepts would come up. And so we had all these different projects. So every so often that would just really push our creativity. And the whole idea was come up with a concept and then figure out how to do it. And so, this particular project, we had an opportunity to do a student show that was at the Whitney Museum, um, and it was the uh, the opening of a Basquiat show. And we were tasked with coming up with designing a skeleton. And what would that look like? What's a concept behind that? Because there's a lot of skeletons in his work. So, you know, I came up with this idea of, okay, what if I had a life-size skeleton that was made of dog biscuits and... Um, just, you know, somehow had to figure out what, what does that look like? What does a skeleton really look like? And how do I translate that into an interesting design made of these dog biscuits of all different sizes? And then I had the problem of like, okay, so dog biscuits are really fragile. Uh, how do I transport this thing and how do I connect these things? So this project became something really larger than life for me because it started with this concept and then he approved it. And then he said, okay, now go figure it out. And that left us to this place of like being scared to death because you know, I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to like, I'm not good with power tools. Believe me, you don't want to see me. I, there's going to be accidents. Somebody's going to end up in the hospital. But I I had to figure out, okay, well, there are people that I can tap that know how to weld. And so they, they helped me figure out how to weld uh, a frame to hang things off of. Then I was actually using a Dremel, you know, with a small drill bit and drilling little holes and gluing wire to attach these, um, different size dog bones together. So this whole thing came together. And then we had the student show uh, at the Whitney Museum and it was an incredible night. Um, and, you know, kind of a once in a lifetime type of thing. And I just remember that being the time when there was like a, a, a switch that went off in me that was, you know, don't let lack of knowledge or skills or anything else budget stop you from a great concept and idea, like figure out how to do that. And so for me, ever since that point, I've really tried to approach every project I come into, whether it's a personal or for a client or whatever, to think in, in those terms of start with a great idea and then figure out how to do it. 
If you need to hire out because there are skills you don't have, then do that. Or if you need to learn a skill, do that. But don't let something stand in the way of a great idea. It seems to me you uh, have a very similar kind of mind to Tara. And, um, yeah, I just can't fathom. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, that's I'll the graphic make, design I'll, thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll make, a, I'll make a skeleton out of dog biscuits. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Very tasty. <laughs> <laughs> so... How did did the dog biscuit sculpture get you your first job in graphic design or if not, how did you get well, it? Well, you know, that's the interesting thing, right? Because it, that doesn't seem like it translates very well. And I'll be honest, it was really more showing my conceptual skills, not necessarily my technical st- skills in terms of, you know, putting together this, this sculpture. Um, but in my portfolio, I kind of had, because I had a double major, it was graphic design and three-dimensional design. And so in my portfolio, when I graduated, I had, you know, half of it was traditional graphic design. And the other half was these three-dimensional uh, sculptures and illustrations that I did that showed more concept and thinking. And that's really the thing that a lot of people honed in on. It wasn't, like I said, necessarily the skills technically on the on the sculpture side, but it was really more, okay, this guy can think, he can come up with concepts, and then he can carry it out. So was that always been your day job then, working in graphics? Pretty much. Um, I did have a 10-year gap where I wasn't doing that, but um, and I'm sure we'll get to that. But uh, <laughs> it, yeah, pretty much I graduated school, went right into the field. And when I graduated, it was actually a pretty bad economic time too. So the first job that I got was at a huge advertising agency. And they had clients like Mobile and Pringles and Heineken and, you know, like all these really huge clients. And uh, I quickly found out that that environment was not for me. It was just too big, too corporate. And uh, from there, just kind of bounced it around to a lot of different, um, you know, smaller boutique agencies where sometimes I was the art department. And uh at, at every turn, it was always like, okay, what what can I learn here? What can I do? And then eventually, you know, I'd hit a ceiling someplace or get restless. And so every maybe four years or so, five years, I'd kind of bounce around to someplace new. So um, you mentioned about having a long period of not creating. Ten years. I mean, that's yes. that's a long time, isn't it, for a creative person not to create. So why did that happen? Um what made you take that massive break? Yeah. So eventually in my design career, I got to the point where, like I said, I was bouncing around every four years or so and just feeling restless. I think there was something in me that just felt a little dissatisfied with either the opportunities, the expression of creativity. Um, And at the same time, I was very, invested in relational things. Like at my home church, I was very plugged in and leading a lot of things where I was serving and volunteering. And that the people stuff really was the thing that lit my heart up at that point. And I felt like my my career had become more of a, a, a job in the sense that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. There was uh, at this point, there were like deadlines every two weeks. I'm cranking out all this work, not even really getting to enjoy what I just did. And then there's another deadline right on top of it. And so started to feel like a little bit like a a part of the machine, the creative machine. Right. And then outside of there, I was very much coming alive with a lot of the relationships that were in my life and helping people. And that harkened back again to when I was a little kid, remembering that feeling of like wanting to be a help to people, wanting to make sure that um, I could offer value somehow. And so I kind of found myself at a crossroads and, you know, kind of a long story, but I ended up going into full-time ministry. And um, that meant, you know, kind of moving, uh, leaving my career, a whole host of other things and really kind of, diving off the cliff, if you will, (laughs) into some unknown. Um, But that was a 10-year journey that taught me a lot about um, just getting more comfortable with risk and getting in there and figuring things out even more so when you don't know um, how to proceed necessarily. There were a lot of instances where like my job title, I didn't have one specific title. It was kind of like I did nursery and children's ministry and college ministry and worship leading and slash, 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 all these kind of like 
different jobs hobbled together. And so I had to figure out what that all looked like. And so in the midst of all that stuff, I didn't do any personal art because I was so focused on trying to adapt to this new role and figuring those, you know, scenarios out and, and how to kind of uh, succeed in those things. Uh, along with that, you know, I ended up uh, launching and planting a church with my um, with my friend. And that was a whole nother thing of kind of like, how do we do this? We don't know. Let's figure it out. And so this whole thing was very uh, kind of crazy, kind of um, just very fast paced. But in the midst of that, I found myself uh, tied to more roles that were administrative. And that really was not in my gifting at all, nor in my passion. And eventually came to the place where, you know, after 10 years, it started to wear on me a lot more than I ever would have thought in not engaging with my own creativity. You know, I'd have like little little spurts here or there with some things maybe, um, but nothing consistent. And that eventually led me to the place where I started suffering from depression. And I didn't even realize it at first until some people around me were like, hey, you know, you're not yourself. And um, And then realizing like, wow, yeah, like this is, I'm kind of uh, all knotted up inside and I don't really know how to fix this. Um, and so it was very painful, dark season for sure. Yeah. So how long did that go on for? Um, well, what inspired you to start creating again? Because obviously you didn't stay in that place forever. Right, right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, as as it became more and more apparent that, yes, I was suffering from depression, uh, I needed to, to start to seek to get some help. And um, as I started doing that, it became more and more obvious that I had to transition out of the leadership roles I was in. And um, and it just meant just time for a change. But I really didn't know what that was going to look like, because on the one hand, I had been in a ministry context for 10 years but felt a little bit chewed up from it. And um, on the other hand, you know, I hadn't been in graphic design for 10 years and a lot of that world I felt like passed me by, you know, as you know, with technology, especially. Um, So I kind of didn't really know where to go from there. And actually that ended up being a blessing in disguise because it caused me to really stop and assess and do a lot of soul searching and a lot of journal writing. And it was through that process that, I started to figure out like, I need to come back to art because my soul needs it because I need it. Like it's not creativity for somebody else, for somebody else's logo or, or packaging or, you know, their projects. But I want to create something just simply because it makes me feel good. And right now I need to figure out how to get back to that. And so it started with me just going like, I emotionally, I'm not even sure I can do this, but I know I need to start moving towards it and figuring out what this looks like again. And so I ended up um, kind of dabbling in a couple of little things here or there. Like I took a class in printmaking and that kind of was a different expression for me. And so that I found at least interesting. I knew that it wasn't a long-term thing that I was going to then go towards, but it got me thinking. It got me engaging again. And so I ended up coming across this idea of of doing a 365 day art journey. And at first I thought to myself, okay, there's no way I'm going to be able to pull this off. I've gone 10 years without doing anything. You know, how am I going to all of a sudden do an, an entire year of showing up every day and doing something? And so I didn't let that scare me to the point of going, I'm just going to dismiss this altogether. But I started entertaining the idea of like, okay, so if I was to do this, what would this look like? How could I do this? How can I make this manageable? And again, lowering the bar enough, knowing that, okay, I'm trying to come out of depression. I haven't done anything for 10 years. I need to set the bar really low. And so I just decided one day I'm, I'm getting a new sketchbook and um, I ended up going sitting in a Starbucks and I was sketching the Starbucks coffee cup and I wrote day one at the top. And I, I looked at it and I felt horrified because <laughs> <laughs> we've, all, like, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I was like, I really hope that nobody's looking over my shoulder. And because if they were like, oh, you went to art school and then they saw what I what I accomplished, you know, technically it was just way embarrassing. But the thing was, I knew that it was all that I can manage for that day. It was 10 minutes. It was an awful wonky Starbucks coffee cup. But 
I learned to love and hate that drawing. I loved it because it signified for me day one on a new journey and, you know, not to despise humble beginnings. And, and I hated it because obviously technically it wasn't what I wanted it to be um, and what I believed I could do and once did do. But I knew that this at least was, let's reintroduce yourself to doing this again. Let's figure this out. Um, and so showing up and engaging in the process at that point was more important than the product, if you will. Have you kept that sketchbook? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Every once in a while, I'll take it out. Um, I've shared it in some videos that I've, I've you know, shown online and so forth. And because I think everybody needs to have some encouragement, especially in the beginning, or if they're returning to their art after being away for a long time, it's a scary thing. And it's, you really fall victim to a lot of that inner critic and just that the whole thought of like, I don't know if I can do this again. Like it was a part of my life maybe once, but does it have a place anymore? And so for me to be able to talk about my experience, I think it helps normalize that a little bit and hopefully encourages some people and says, look, if I can do this, then anybody can do this. Have you got any other tips then for someone who wants to start drawing again after a long break? Yeah, I would say give yourself grace and what I mean by that is like, if you were going to speak to somebody else who was interested in coming back to their art, you would never treat that person in such a way that you, you belittled them um, and set the bar so high and became like this taskmaster. But often that's what we do with ourselves. Um, and so I would say, start in a place of grace, lower the bar as much as you have to. Don't think about like this grand masterpiece, but sit down and simply just engage in the process for as, as long as you, you can. And if all you can muster is 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes is a lot better than, than not showing up at all and get engaged with the process, get things moving again, because once you start moving, it's a lot easier to add to that time or to then start to explore different ideas. But if you're like coming from a hard stop, it's very difficult to, to first get those wheels turning again. Yeah, I do. I completely agree with you. And also, when you have done it before, though, I, I kind of think you, you do get it quicker, don't you? You know, yeah. than somebody who's never done it before. So, you know, it's often a bit horrific to begin with when you look right. at your own work, but it, it does sort of, you do get it. I think, Tara, you felt like that, didn't you, when you got back into the drawing with a pencil, which you hadn't done for years. Yeah. You, it took you it a while. Comes back. But, it, you know, it came back pretty quick. But you mentioned um, that you started with this 365 day drawing challenge. So, what kind of subjects are you drawn to? Well, you know, it's funny in the beginning, it was so wide open that I was like, I don't, I don't even know, like, what do Can I trust myself? Can I trust my instincts? You know, can I mm. trust thinking about what I think I like anymore? I don't really know. So I decided that I was going to set up small projects within the larger project. So what I mean by that is I said, okay, what if I do seven days to start with? That is probably more doable and I can wrap my head around seven days as opposed to a whole year or even like 90 days or something. So I said, okay, for seven days, I'm going to draw my pets or animals and just see where that takes me. And so it, it gave me enough of a framework to work within, to let me play, to let me figure out, is this something that I'm interested in really? Uh, and if not, then seven days comes and goes and they go, okay, let's move on to another theme or another, you know, um, smaller project. Uh, and, and all within that holding things very loosely, because again, the last thing that you want to do is set yourself up for failure in thinking, okay, I'm going to do 90 days of, you know, floral arrangements or whatever. And I'm like two days in and I'm like, yeah, I'm not really that interested in this. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. not a flower guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it, it's really, for me, it was, it was it, playing and experimenting were huge. I needed to do that in the theme. And I also needed to do that in the medium that I was using. Um, I tried to mix things up as much as I could to keep things interesting. Um, 
and at the same time, give me some tastes of something that go, is there more here that I want to explore? It's quite a good idea, I think, to chunk it down like that, isn't it? Because like you say, yes. it's not it's not nearly as intimidating saying, right, I'm going to start with this seven days than it is to say, right, I've got 365 days of drawing ahead of me. <laughs> right, exactly. Did, did you ever uh, miss a day? And Because I know that there are people out there who might take on a challenge and then because they miss one day, all of a sudden they're like, well, I might as well give up. <laughs> you right. know, it's, it's a bit like that diet thing, isn't it? You eat the chocolate bar and it's like, oh, well, that's that then, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> so, so you know, did this ever happen to you with your, your challenge? Did you miss a day? And, and if you did, you know, did you just think, oh, well, that's fine. Tomorrow's another day. How did you deal with it? Yeah, um, I can say honestly that I have not missed a day. Oh, wow. Uh, even You're still going, aren't you? Yeah, it's eight plus years. It'll be nine oh, years wow. in April. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And Christmas Day even? Yeah, uh, holidays, yeah. even being sick, um, oh, vacations, God. you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, I just built in a rhythm and it's just as part of what I do. It's It's just as much a part as getting up, brushing my teeth, showering, eating, whatever. Um, so do, do you set, do you set like aside a, a certain amount of time every day at the same time of every day? Or do you just kind of work it around each day and, and the time you've got around what you're doing? Yeah. So now I have a loose time, but pretty much the same time. It's usually in the mm. evenings at which I create. And a lot of times, honestly, if it's like the family sitting around watching TV or I'm watching TV, I'm kind of not really watching TV. I'm, I have the TV on and I'm also creating Um, and I've kind of learned to use that time that way. Um, but in the beginning, it was really important for me to learn to schedule it because I knew myself enough that if I, if, if it was too loose, I would have more opportunity to not show up. And I didn't want that to be the case. And so I remember, I think it was either somebody telling me or me reading it in a book someplace, but it was like, show up like you would for an appointment. Uh, put it on your calendar, schedule it. So, you know, at this time, this is the time at which you're not doing anything else, but, you know, showing up for your creativity. And in, in the beginning, it was, you know, like I said, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, really whatever I could manage. And maybe I was, you know, and at this point I was working a day job. And so I was stealing moments during a lunch hour or maybe in the morning, not really, because I'm I'm a morning person. Uh, I'm not a morning person, I should say. <laughs> I'm more of a night person. But you know, if if I had to, um, it was either morning or night. Um, it was basically identifying some time slots that I could steal for my creativity, and um, and then there were even other times when I'm like, what? Where are those times when I'm wasting time? Like, say, I, if I was out at a store and there was a really long line of people I'm waiting in. And instead of standing there getting frustrated, looking at my watch, tapping my foot, getting aggravated with the people in front of me for not moving, you know, whatever it is, I was like, why don't I use that time more effectively and carry a sketchbook with me and sketch while I'm waiting? Uh, we all have those times when we're, we're you know, would, would normally it would be wasted time. How about we learn how to redeem that time for our creativity? And so it was like little tips like that, too, that were helpful for me in figuring out how to um continually show up and maximize the time that I had how do you feel about working digitally uh, as opposed to using traditional media cuz i know you've transitioned now haven't you yeah you know it's funny because early on i swore it off and i think because it had too much to do with feeling like graphic design and that was career you know that yes, was work I totally know that feeling yeah and yeah. so I, plus there was also something about like the process that was a little clunky at that point. And I just felt like things were a little bit colder and quite honestly, in the beginning, coming back to my art, I needed to have that tactile sense of like, I'm going to get my hands dirty. I want to start flinging some paint around and just making a mess. And that was the other thing too, is like understanding that like, I'm a mess and that's okay. Like I need to embrace my mess <laughs> instead of, <laughs> you know, constantly pushing towards trying to be a perfectionist in some things, like embrace more of my mess. And, and then actually I find more freedom in my process. And so, you know, for, for me, a lot of like design, it was very much about precision. 
you know, lining things up in grids and a lot of that kind of work. And so for me in my personal art, I needed to push all the more in the opposite direction of just start making a mess, start rolling some things around, just, you know, splatter and splash and whatever, like have fun. And so that was very important to me. And then the more that I did that, the more I was exploring, like I said, different mediums. Then I made allowances for myself eventually. I want to say, though, it probably wasn't until maybe year two or three that I started entertaining the idea of, okay, what happens if I start doing some digital illustration? And the big game changer for me was when Apple came out with the pencil. Um, Because before that, I had an iPad and I had these other stylists that they were okay, but it was kind of... um, it didn't feel the same to me. It wasn't as intuitive. And so that didn't really encourage me to continue on the route of digital illustration at all. But then when the pencil came, like I said, with Apple and I got a new iPad and that was just a complete game changer along with some other programs like Procreate that came out and I started using those and I was like, wow, this is incredible. I can actually get something that looks like it was done with traditional materials but do it in a digital style and, and um, you know, process. And the nice thing about, I found was that I was able to play and experiment mixing different mediums and things digitally that I didn't have to worry about dry time or I didn't have to worry about experimenting with something and having it be, you know, wrecked because, oh, I can't undo that. You know, there's no, uh, <laughs> there's no undo button, <laughs> you know. Did I tell you what, I'd love an undo button on my canvas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> so talk us through your process then. How do you get from the initial idea to the finished piece? Yeah, so it really depends on what that I'm what what I'm trying to do. Um sometimes I have a very specific idea that comes to me and it's rooted in concept. Um and so I'll see something or I'll be inspired by something. And I'll start to kind of follow the rabbit trail and then just kind of get in there and start to flesh something out and build slowly. Um, Most of the time I'm being inspired by something that I'm seeing, whether it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff now that's really more like in entertainment. So whether it's movies, TV, uh, pop culture things um, that's inspired me a lot. And so I'll, set about doing some, you know, portraits of, of certain celebrities or actors or whatnot. Um, other times in the past, it's been driven by, like I, I did a whole, I want to say a good year, year and a half where I was doing yoga art. And uh, if you know me, that's kind of funny. And a lot of people who do know me, they were like, dude, what is the deal with the yoga art? Cause you are not, you're not yoga guy. You know, you're uh, you know, you're a 40 something overweight guy. Who's, you know, <laughs> how does yoga fit into that? Right. So I just said, you know what, honestly, that came about because I was looking for some interesting poses to draw and I couldn't get out to some, you know, drawing classes or or sessions. And so I started just thinking, okay, where can I start to find some of the stuff? And I'm on Instagram a lot. I've posted on Instagram since day one with my, you know, uh, daily art making journey. And so I started to see some people that, that I knew post some yoga posts and I'm like, wow, they're like really doing interesting things with their bodies um, and and creating these shapes and these just, it was interesting to look at. And I said, well, I wonder if I could start just drawing some of those things. So that's what I started to do is I started to use reference from Instagram for some people that I knew. And then eventually some people I didn't know, and then would do this drawing digitally and then post it. And then I would tag the person who helped inspire it. So it became almost like a community thing or like a a little give back, you know, and a lot of times these people were surprised and they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you, you know, drew something that was inspired by something I posted. Um, And so again, that kind of checked all the boxes for me as far as not just creating something just solely for myself and not just working on something for technical craft, but then also having that element of, is this helpful for somebody else? You know, how does this uh, bring value to somebody else? You know? So what would you do? Rough sketch out first and, and work that up? Or? Uh, some, yeah, many times I would. And then there were other times when I would just start picking random digital tools and then start laying, just do mark making really. Um, and then building from there, looking for shapes, looking for textures and patterns, 
I'm looking for a lot of shadow and light. Um, you know, I really love high contrast things where you can tell it's, it's creating these shapes. It's, it's, uh, there's a certain mood to things with uh, high high shadow and, and highlight. So um, I try to incorporate all that stuff in as I'm going. And a lot of that stuff has just become intuitive background stuff, honestly, that I don't even think about anymore. Um, I just kind of get in there and then start moving some things around a lot. I've heard you talk about creative mashups and that concept is really important to you. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, I think concept was probably drilled into me when I was in art school because of design. Um, because so much of that is not just, you know, Hey, here's how to make something look nice or visually engaging, but what is it saying? What is it communicating? You know, that's at the heart of graphic design is communication. And so I think for me, a lot of the professors I had and a lot of things I was drawn towards, they were the people who were always saying to me, like have an opinion, um, do something that, that says something like, yeah, it's great to have a piece of work that can show technical ability, but if that's all it is, then there's something a little bit more hollow for that. As far as my particular tastes go sometimes, um, I, I, and, and my process, you know, like, I want to know that I'm, I'm saying something more. It's not just a, an exercise in improving my technical skills or, um, or displaying technical skills. Um, it's more about a concept thinking again, what do I want to say? What do I want to, what do I want to make somebody feel? Uh, I'm a very feely person. <laughs> so, um, that's really important to me. And so these, the, the idea of a, a creative, you know, mashup, these concepts really came about because I was looking at different things and then all of a sudden I'd have this idea, this concept would come to me and I'd be like, oh my gosh, like that, that's making me smile right now. So I need to execute this so I can make somebody else smile. So for instance, um, I've done a few in the past where, you know, they're again, centered around maybe pop culture or some kind of, um, kind of identifiable elements. Um, I think that's really what the key has been. And so for, for me, one was taking, uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, Captain America and mashing them together. And so I have this character that looks like he's suited up in Captain America's uniform uh, and yet has the face of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and it's, you know, Captain Abe America and, um, you know, things like that. So that I always appreciate when I'm I'm looking at art or maybe it's, you know, something really quick. And there's this moment of like almost like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And you're taking someone's expectation and you're putting a spin on it. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I see what they did there. Oh, that's clever. Okay. You know, like I appreciate that kind of stuff. And so every so often I really try to create something that that gives somebody else that experience too. Um, I love the imagination fun. that goes behind that as well. It's, it's yeah. really creative thinking, isn't it? So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, eight years, eight years of drawing every day. Have mm -hmm. you in that time ever experienced a creative block? And if so, how did you overcome it? Yeah, I don't necessarily say that I had a block um, because there's so much of the showing up daily that in the beginning, it's a lot about creating momentum and creating a habit. And not so much about the actual work that you're producing, because it's going to be bad. Um, <laughs> that's kind of a given. <laughs> you have to get a lot of bad work out of the way before you get to some good work. So I realized that, okay, if I'm doing this, I'm showing up every day, there's a mechanism, uh, there's a system in place that I'm harnessing. And so I know that I'm going to show up. And now it's a matter of, okay, well, what am I going to create when I show up, right? And that's where the block a lot of times comes. Yeah. Well. I've learned that, and this again kind of harkens back to graphic design days where, you know, back in the day, back in the day for any kids listening, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> in the olden to, days. <laughs> exactly. They used to have what was called a swipe file. And a swipe file was literally a, a file, uh, like a physical file that you would have different clippings. Maybe it was photo reference. Maybe it was a design reference, whatever it was, whatever kind of reference but you would be putting this stuff in this file for future use or inspiration. And you would collect these things along the way as you saw them. 
And so very much like how people are using Pinterest and mood boards and things like that these days, um, or vision boards, whatever you want to call them. It was the same kind of concept where you're collecting things along the way, knowing that this is your inspiration file. This is someplace that you can go to so that you can, when you need to have reference, when you need to have inspiration, you have a, a full well to go to. You're not trying to draw from an empty well. And I think that's where a lot of people get into trouble is that they wait until last minute and then they're trying to draw from an empty well. And they're like, I have block. I don't know what to do. Nothing seems interesting. Anything that I'm trying to create just seems hollow or flat um, and they don't know what to do. And so giving yourself the ability to go someplace that you've invested in previously, specifically for that time, that you can then go to and be inspired, be drawing upon those things, having something to play with, that gives you a tremendous uh, start. And so I would say that is definitely um, something that I try to employ as much as possible. That is and then on top of that, advice, I would yeah. also say that you, like for me, the times when I've I've experienced any kind of block really within this eight year period that I've been doing stuff has been when things have gotten a little boring and I needed to inject some more play or change things up somehow so that I kept engaging. Because if I felt like I was doing the same, too much of the same thing over and over again, I was doing a series of something. By the end of the month, it was 30 days of something. I'm like, okay, this is getting dry or I'm falling into habits of doing things the same old way. I need something to keep me engaged. How can I change this up a little bit? Yeah, because I was going to say, uh, uh, what about then, rather than saying, have you experienced a creative block? Have you ever just thought, I don't feel like it today? Because there must be times when you feel like that, but you obviously just power through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And knowing that tomorrow's a new day, and if I did something today that is horrible, that I feel is just, ew, I don't want anybody, <laughs> I don't want to remember this, you know. Um, then I can rest easy knowing, again, tomorrow's a new day and I have a new opportunity for a blank canvas. Mm. So if you don't feel like drawing as well, would you just sit there and do something for five minutes? Uh, typically, I push myself to do more than that. I mean, there are there haven't been too many times where I'm just like, okay, I'm just really not that into it. I'm just going to like phone it in and uh, <laughs> push my pen around the page <laughs> and this scribble that I happen to come across. That's what I'm calling today's, you know, hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> assignment, if you will. I, I tr really try to do something. Um, and even if it means, again, trying to approach a new subject or a new um, inject something new in the process that sometimes will help me even when I'm not feeling like it. Cause I know that I can't trust my feelings in those instances. Do you always finish a drawing in one session? Uh, in terms of my daily creative projects, yes. There are some things obviously that need more than just one setting. Um, and those are a case by case basis. A lot of times, like if it's a lot of client work that I'm doing, or there's something that's a little bit more involved, like I am actually using traditional materials, uh, doing a painting or something, then it will be, you know, multiple days and multiple sessions. But the thing that I've learned in doing a majority of the stuff in one session has been like not getting bogged down in overthinking things and having to commit to things a lot quicker. And there's this pace that, you just start to get into where you're you you then start to become so prolific with a lot of things and again not everything's like a, a, a something you want to sell or hang on to or even show but you really start to to mine a lot of things quicker because of that pace are there any books or courses that have inspired you along the way uh there yeah i mean there's one in particular that i'll mention that was really game changer for me early on and it was uh, the creative license by Danny Gregory. And oh, I love Danny Gregory. Yeah, <laughs> Danny Gregory is, is I've amazing. I've got that book. Yeah, creative yes, license. Yes. Yeah. So for me, that was the thing that, like, when I was coming back to my art, and I had all this like mental baggage too of like, you know, for for me, art early on, I had convinced myself that I really couldn't draw. I wasn't a great artist uh, because I couldn't do photorealistic style. 
And for, for whatever reason, that was the benchmark that I had set out for myself. And when I tried to do it, I would get very frustrated and I didn't like the results. And so the whole thing was just shrouded in this like yuck. And so when I started reading this book, Danny started to talk a little bit about that. And he said, you know, if you want photorealism, then just take a picture. And I know that sounds like a funny sentence, but for whatever reason, that hit me the right way in that moment. And I was like, you know what? I actually enjoy photography too. And so if I want photorealism as a result, then I'll just employ that means of creativity. And then he said, you know, showing up to do a five or 10 minute drawing is better than no drawing at all. And I took that to heart from day one on my journey. And then he also said, sometimes the wonkiness of what it is that you're drawing actually makes it a more interesting drawing and sometimes becomes something that's part of your style. And I had never thought about it that way because it was always this sense of if I'm trying to draw something and I feel like something goes sideways, it's a little wonky, proportions aren't you know spot on, I would, it would immediately fly into... Uh, this is horrible. I can't do this or frustrated or, or, you know, there's this disconnect of what I see in my head and what I'm seeing on the page. And then instead of embracing it and saying, okay, this is what I did right now. It, what is successful about this? What is interesting about this? And maybe it wasn't intentional in the beginning, but then if there's something about that, that I like, how can I then revisit that and make that intentional? Um, so it was really just a different set of lenses to look at things and to approach the work by. Um, that really unleashed a lot for me in the early days, especially. We actually interviewed Danny Gregory. I can't remember what um, what podcast episode it was, but it was fairly early on. So if anybody hasn't heard of him, it'd be worth going back and having listened. But yeah, he was very inspiring because, you know, like you say, he, he takes away that fear of just, just, trying and having a go and not being yeah. perfect. I mean, you know, I always say, you know, if you were going to sit at a piano, you'd never expect your very first time to be able to play a tune, would you? But for some right, reason, right. as artists, you, you you know, no matter whether you're starting from the very beginning or not, just because you're an adult, you think, well, I should I should know how to draw. I should just be able to do it. Right. <laughs> so it's strange, isn't it, how, how differently people think, you know, along the lines of art. Yeah. So what um, tips would you give anyone who wants to build a creative habit? Yeah, so I think it's, like I mentioned earlier, breaking things down into small bite-sized projects or, um, you know, engaging with it in such a way that you don't feel overwhelmed from day one. Hmm. Um, think about today. Like if this is the day you've decided I'm returning to my art, then just think about today and like have maybe, you know, the next whatever, five days or seven days out of that chunk, have some thoughts around that. So that way, when you're done with today, you're moving on to tomorrow and you have something at least set up. Um, so you're not just, again, starting from square one going like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to engage with this. Um and again, I think in the early days, it's really more about establishing the habit than it is about the actual work that you're doing. And when you realize that, that also takes a tremendous amount of pressure off because, you know, I talk to a lot of people about this whole idea of masterpiece mentality that plagues us, where as artists, we want to sit down and we want in one session to walk away with something we feel is our masterpiece. And that just doesn't happen. Like that didn't happen for the masters either, <laughs> you know, no. um, you know, a lot of times what we're seeing in museums and stuff, that's like the Instagram highlight reel for back then. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we, we need to understand that there was process. We need to understand that there were, there was a lot of trial and error. There was a lot of exploring. There were a lot of mistakes that were made on the way to getting to the masterpiece. And so I think when we start to adopt that mentality, it takes a lot of pressure off and it allows us to move in some freedom and some play to, to remember, this is like, this is supposed to be fun folks. I don't know if that's, you know, a thought <laughs> to you, but really it should be something fun and exciting. Um, and, and that you become passionate about not something that you sit down and you drudge and that you stress over and that you, you become so uh, self-critical about um, that's, you're never going to engage with, the true creative part in yourself. If you're approaching it in that way, you're always going to have a block, you know? 
You've actually got a Facebook group, haven't you, as well, called um, Daily Creative Habit. Is, are yes. you teaching people about that in there? Yes. So this is a, a, a new group. I just started this October. And the reason why I launched this group, Daily Creative Habit, is because I found that so many artists that I've spoken to, and not just visual artists, but just creatives, right? So that we have some people who are writers, some people who are musicians, you know, et cetera, in this group. And everybody says the same thing. They're like... I really wish that I had more consistency with my showing up and engaging with my creative process. You know, I, or they go, I have certain projects I want to see happen. Maybe they have a certain body of work they want to develop, um, or they have something that they want to package together and, and monetize, whatever it is, whatever their creative goals are, they have these things, but yet somehow they found that it's more like flirting with their art. You know, they show up kind of like when they feel like it and when they're like, hey, you know, how you doing? You know, <laughs> it's, it's um, but it doesn't yield the results that they want. And that only comes when you consistently show up and put the time and work in. And so I've created this group to be a place where people can come. They can post some things. I'm sharing about my uh, process and just my learnings for over the past eight plus years of you know, how did I go from 10 years of doing nothing into now eight plus years of showing up every day? What are the things that I've learned along the way? Um, what are the things that I've had to struggle with along the way and try to normalize a lot of that stuff? Because I found that the more that we talk about those things, the more it does normalize and the less that that other artists feel like they're isolated, uh, the less that they feel like they're unique in their trials. You know, uh, us artists, we're great at that, right? We We like to feel as unique as possible. We want to be as different as possible, right? <laughs> but we also shackle ourselves sometimes with, you know, the 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 rough things that we go through, thinking that we're the only ones who struggle with the inner critic. We're the only ones who struggle with perfectionist streaks or, you know, with procrastination. Um, but the truth is the more that we talk about it and the more people lend their stories and journeys to it, then uh, there's power in that community. Um, you've also got a course called Your Artist Journey. Does that follow on kind of from the Facebook group? Yeah. So Your Artist Journey course actually came first. Uh, I did that a couple of years ago. And I, I created that course because I realized uh, probably about halfway, maybe a little more halfway into my journey that the things that I was experiencing and the lessons I was learning, I was like, this isn't just for me. Like, yes, it's been tremendously helpful and has completely transformed my creative path. But there are other people who I think can benefit from a lot of the things that I've learned along the way of what to do, what not to do, certain principles and methods and how to, again, uh, build momentum in their own creativity. And so I said, you know, what better way than just to put some of this stuff into a course where it's, you know, self-guided and people can, you know, start to glean some of those insights and apply them to their own journey. So tell us about your your podcast. Yeah, so my podcast is Creative Chats, and um, I love speaking with all types of creatives. Uh, so it's visual artists, it's musicians, it's actors, it's uh, a lot of times creative entrepreneurs, because I found that even if they're creating content, right, such as blog posts or um, you know social media. Um, material or course content, whatever it is that anybody's creating, everybody has that thread that runs through no matter what the expression is that every, that you can relate to. This, this thing of, I have an idea, I have this project, I have this thing I want to sit down and create. Now, how do I sit down and do this in such a way that it's successful, that it's clear, that it does what I want it to do? Um, and so, I interview all sorts of people and just ask about their journey. Again, try to normalize some of the things that for some of the people who are listening, who maybe they live in a really remote area and they're not in an arts community and they feel like the odd man out. And so for them to listen to somebody else's story, all of a sudden they resonate with that and go, oh, wow, like that means so much to me because now I can hear how somebody else dealt with that. Um, or they get turned on to somebody else's, um, you know, projects and creativity and they can find some inspiration in some other people's work. And so I love having these chats. Um, they're exactly what they sound like, you know, it's very casual, but, um, I really try to explore these different themes with each guest and, um, and just have a, a, a great time personally, just learning more about them, being curious 
and then sharing that with our, all the listeners. So, so what's your podcast called? Just I don't know if you said. Just so yeah, our listeners the, know, it's called Creative Chats Podcast. Creative Chats. Okay. Yep. So, what about your plans for the future then? Because obviously, you've got a lot going on with your group and your podcasts and your own yeah. art. So, what are your goals then for the future? Or are you just, you know, taking things as they come? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I've I've never been somebody who's been like well, here's my five-year goal and plan. Like no. I'm not somebody who spells things out that specifically. I have certain projects and certain um, products and things and services that I want to see happen. Um, and I try to employ the 90-day goal system, you know, where you're planning out 90 days and then that gives you enough time and focus to really drill down on something as opposed to, you know, somewhere in the next five years, I want to do, you know, whatever. Um because I found that then things tend to get lost a little bit too much. You're not really thinking about how much time does it really take to create that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so I think in broad strokes, it's more of what I'm doing now, uh, more focused um, in terms of two streams. There's me creating, you know, so it's more of graphic design and more illustration and projects, uh, passion projects that I want to do. And working with the people that I feel um, just connected to and that are doing some great work, being able to be a little more choosy maybe about some of the clientele. And then on the other side, really pouring gas on helping other people um, because I want to help as many other creative people as possible. And that's in terms of the the Facebook group and the course and the podcast, uh, speaking, you know, those kind of things, um, offering resources uh, for help for their own journey. Because I think when we realize that it's not just about us and our own creativity, but it's also about us investing in other people. That's when we can really maximize our impact. And to know that like we've had people who have meant so much to us on our journey, who took the time to invest in us, then we need to turn around and do that for somebody else and not let our lack of uh, confidence or experience or anything else that we want to throw in the way there as an excuse. Don't let that stop us, but be for somebody else what you wish that you had or what you did have for yourself and where can people find out more about you yeah so the best place is my website which is mikebrennan.me m e and from there you'll see links to all sorts of stuff uh, of my graphic design and my podcast and my illustration work um and then you can also follow me on uh, instagram i'm most active which is mike bone b o n e and that uh, harkens back to my my Mike Bone project that I spoke about earlier uh, with the dog biscuits. Uh, that's kind of where yeah. that title came from. <laughs> I was confused when I first saw that until I heard about it. Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you ever so much for coming on and uh, talking to us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I loved it. Oh, it really has been fun. And you've been a great inspiration, I'm sure, to all of our listeners. It's been fabulous. So thank you. Thank you. I really hope that I have been. And I always love connecting with people. So feel free to reach out. Okay, then take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes. Back soon. <laughs>